It is the most wonderful time of the year. I'm Zach Martin with New HD TV and our special guest today, John Di Di Nicola and Frankie Previtt. Did I say it right? Frankie Previtt. Previtt. I'm bad with uh, last names. That's why we just go on a first good. name basis. But if anybody's watching, they can actually see the names in print. So, right? Yep, absolutely. Now, you guys might, they might not recognize the name, but hey, there's no doubt about it. People will recognize the music. Two great songwriters with us this afternoon. And we're going to get right to it. We're going to talk about two iconic songs. We're going to play a couple of videos. Give us the, the background on these two iconic Dirty Dancing classics that we're all familiar with and as disc jockeys played over and over and over again. To the delight of the listener, I might add. Yeah, well, the, you know, the song really uh, started by me getting a phone call from the president of Millennium Records after he closed his label. And two years later, he uh, called, called me up and said, uh, Jimmy Einer, by the way, was his name. And uh, Jimmy said, Frankie, I got this uh, little movie I'm working on. I'd like you to write a song for it. And I said, Jimmy, I really don't have time. I said, I'm trying to get another record deal. I'm, um, I, I just don't have time. And he goes, make time. It's going to change your life. And I'm like, yeah, right. You're going to change my life. And he goes, no, I got a good feeling about this movie. And I said, OK, what's the name of the movie? And he says to me, Dirty Dancing. And my hand went to my forehead. And I'm like, oh, God, Jimmy's doing porn. I'm thinking he's doing a porn flick. And uh, he goes, no, this is a good little movie. And I really, really got a good feeling about it. I'd like you to write a song. So, the, you know, I said, OK. And he goes, that's the good news. The bad news is it's got to be seven minutes long. So. You know, I was already working with John for about six months or so because I was still working on doing another Frankie and the Knockout record. And uh, so the first person I called was, was John because we had already written a bunch of songs together. And the very first song that we wrote together was a song called Hungry Eyes. So that was already in our coffers. And I said, we have a chance. So he called uh, a friend of his up who had more than four tracks eight tracks and said and a drummer you know, yeah and donnie markowitz so that the two of them sent me a track no. and from that track you know i'm listening to it and i got in my car and i'm driving on the garden state parkway exit 140 i jam this cassette into my dashboard and i start listening to the music and how i write is i jam to the music and then phonetic sounds come out and I just started jamming, going, nin, nin, I'm of my life, nin, nin, I'm of my life. And I scribbled time of my life on an envelope, and the rest is history. <laughs> All right, that's a good one. So, Joe, were you driving, uh, John, were you driving around when you uh, started to write some of these lyrics or, or songs? Frankie actually wrote the lyrics to both songs. Uh, I do the music part of it. And uh, was I driving around? Um, no. Um, well, let's take Hungry Eyes. Uh, I had just gotten a brand new Roland Juno 106 keyboard. And there is this one sound, I think it's number 36, and it has that <laughs> has that chime. Blung, blung, blung. And and then when you play chords, it's kind of like a nice big fat chord, even with that same chimey sound. So uh as I've told Frankie before, um that song played itself down. I mean, I just sat at that piano keyboard at Juno 106, and I'd say within 10 to 15 minutes, that song was structurally together for me musically, including chimes, glung, glung, glung. It just, uh, you know, it doesn't always happen that way. In fact, it rarely happens that way, but this time it did. And like I said, I would say 10, 15 minutes, that song just popped out. I'm not surprised to hear that because uh, time and time again, whether it's Mike Rutherford or Ozzy Osbourne, you, you name the guy. Yeah. And I'll ask, how long did it take you to write that song? I go five to 10 minutes. I'm like, yeah. really? <laughs> you know, I, it's unbelievable. Yeah. There, there are other times where you, 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 like I just recently recorded a whole, a whole song and I scrapped it and I started all over again and a completely different feel, same song different feel, different chord changes. And so sometimes it takes uh, a number of, uh, you know, yeah. goes at it, but 
But uh, sometimes it falls out. And that was one of those. I, I've heard other songwriters say it, it almost seems like, and Frankie says this about the lyrics for the time of my life. It almost seems like there's an, a, a divine intervention. You just, you, you're just a vessel almost. It just comes out. I and mean, I don't yeah. know. I can't explain it really. That, that's pretty way, pretty much the way it goes. I mean, it's sort of like asking a quarterback, how did you make that throw? It's like, well, I saw the guy was open. Put it over. Well, there. You know that's true too. You know when I when I play basketball or any sport, as soon as you start thinking, you start getting roadblocks. It's when you just go with the flow. You just get into it and just go. That's when the you know real music comes out. So basically, your message is to everybody listening or watching: don't think about it. Don't right? think. About it. Don't think about anything. <laughs> you have an excuse. I wasn't thinking. You know, what do you want? I, I, well, that's the other thing. Um, it wasn't until I got to Nashville to to get a cover, uh, a, a country cover of Hungry Eyes. And, you know, they're all like top notch studio players down there. And they're the ones who said, hey, you know, you realize this is a whole key change here right in the beginning. I've been meaning to tell you, gone, gone, gone. Key change. I, I didn't even, you know, I'm not thinking that. It just, it's just, uh, it just happened. You know, it's what so, you heard. Exactly. What you felt. Yeah. All right, Frankie. Um, now, when you guys write a song together, I get the, the the kind of the feeling like you guys have been together so long. You're like a Lennon McCartney, Elton John, Bernie Toplin kind of combination. Do you, do you guys work well separately? Work better together? How, how does it work for the both of you after 33 plus years? I think usually, you know, uh, John will come up with a piece of music and, uh, you know, send it to me. And then we discuss the structure of the music and, and the feeling of the music and uh, you know, we, maybe we tweak it a, a tad from where it is originally. And then, you know, then in, in on my side of the court, uh, I have to find that melody and, and before I can write a lyric. And mm. so I am always jamming melody, you know, listening to the changes and getting the feel. And then as, you know, as soon as I find that melody, sometimes phonetic sounds come out of me in that process. And like in time of my life, nah, 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 I'm of my life. you know, these phonetic sounds sometimes are the seed that was planted that should, I'm telling myself ahead of time what I should be writing about. And, you know, I, I kind of lucked out with time of my life because I would have never written that particular style of music. It wasn't in the vein of music that I was trying to, uh, that Frankie and the Knockouts was Hungry Eyes was more in the vein of Frankie and the Knockouts, mm. but definitely not time of my life. But I, I got a good feeling from the music. And if I feel something from the music, it comes out of me. That's wonderful. And now, that's how... uh, John, so Frank worked on these um, the lyrics and then he hands them off to you. Does he go, hey, I got these lyrics and here's what was going on in my head. What, what can you do with this? Is that how it works? Uh, with Frankie and I, um, sometimes, you know, I'll give my feedback back to him. Um, uh, you know, Frankie's a, a singer, you know, first and foremost, almost, I mean, now he's a songwriter, but so, uh, you know, he's got a good natural feel about where he'd like to hear the melody. And I mean, I guess once in a while I'll say, well, maybe this lyric or that lyric, but for the most part, yeah, as a lead singer, he, he kind of knows where he's going. There, there are songs like uh, um, "You're the Only One," which I I sent to Frankie, where I had a, a melody, and then for the most part, he may tweak that melody, but for the most part, that was a lyrical thing. But uh, you know, we we have a give and take on on both our sides, uh, I would say. Now, yeah, uh, gentlemen, answer me this question: How many? Because I I don't. I think I've I've had somebody explain this to me in the past, but I just don't remember. How many chords are there to work with when writing a song? Chords or just chords? Well, you know, there's only twelve notes. Okay, um, so that yeah. So I mean, I don't know how many chords you could make out of so that. So you say have twelve chords, but you have sharps, flats, diminished. No, no, it's twelve twelve notes. That's all. Notes, there. But, but if you're doing um, well, if from you, C to C. Yeah, right? an octave. You got twelve notes. Twelve notes, right? But so you have the key of C, the key of uh, D, the key of E. But you have a flat, you have a, a minor, you have a diminished in each one of those keys. Right. 
Right. So to, to count it out, I, I never thought. I don't know. I don't know if it has a good many, You have the I'm ninth, the anybody, seventh. I, I guess it's a finite number. I, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody ask that question. Like, for instance, if you're playing a C and then you play the D above the next C, that's a called a nine. That's the right. nine. That's the, the nine of the C nine. chord. Um, um, so, I mean, chord, I don't know how many chords. That's a great question. How many chords are there? Well, I, I'm In sure one it's... C. Someone, some, somebody listening somewhere will figure it out mathematically yeah. because music is mathematics as well. It's got to really yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Um, but here's here's the thing. I've always been amazed because you only have so much to work with. You say 12 notes so that there's 12 different combinations you could possibly come up with. And if they're separate too far, they might not work. Or if they're too close, they might just be ordinary. So I was always amazed at how people come up with all of these different types of chord progressions and how they string the notes together, how they put a melody together. And, and I guess we're back to sports. Like I, I can't explain how I did it. I just did exactly. it. Um, exactly. So I guess maybe I'm a frustrated musician because I've always wondered how, you know, people do that. And then the other thing I always would be in fear of is plagiarizing somebody like coming up with the idea of a song only to find out that, Oh my gosh, somebody already came up with this, tune and now i'm in trouble because i i went like george harrison and i was uh unconsciously subconsciously yeah. plagiarizing the chiffons wasn't that it right he's, do still, lang, fine. Do lang, lang. he's still fine right. my yeah. sweet lord yeah i get it exactly yeah. i i um um i just lost my train of thought so well i was asking like how do you prevent yourself from coming oh, up with I songs know. right i i oh oftentimes i'll I'll come up with a melody or, or something and I'll go, I'll, I'll think, oh, geez, that, I wonder if that's like this song. I, it sounds in my head. I'm thinking, oh, God, I, I sort of, I sort of swap, you know, grab that from that song. And then I'll go to the song and listen and I'll, and I'll realize they're not as close as I think they are. And they're certainly well within the realm. That happens to me often. But, but go, John, you know, I really, I that, you know? Th there are, um, I think we all borrow from each other. You know, back in in even the Beatles, and and them listening to you know er, early blues and Chuck Berry. I mean, they've got songs. I'm like, are did they just rip off Chuck Berry here? Exactly what I'm saying. saying. So Richard. you can't worry about that stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, you just got to finish your thought, and and then take a step back after it's done, and let the public tell you if you rip somebody right. off. You know, yeah. uh, because I think that. It may be similar, but there's a certain amount of bars and, and measures that you're allowed to have before right. it's copyright. Uh, well, okay. look, what, look what happened to uh, to um, Rob Bolton. Thick. Robin Thick. Oh yeah, Robin Thick, uh, where Me, he was doing the Marvin Gaye thing. That was that, that was oh, that, oh, that, see, was, that, a, that was so obvious. Though. No, that it wasn't was obvious. That wasn't obvious. That's like that should have never happened that was um well, there was I, I no portal similarity there was no melodic similarity it was a feel so then bo diddley should be the richest man on the planet because anytime anybody goes bonk 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 ka bonk bonk that's his then right. They claimed, all right i guess i guess you get see you guys claimed, know more than i would on that they right. claimed that it was his feel you know every every uh r and b do what song? Da, 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 da. Yeah, and there's no melody. The or, melody is not the same, and the key chords aren't the same. That was a travesty, I think. Okay, so you know what else is just amazing that nobody realizes. Speaking of that, and and Robert Plant would say their interpretations. Led Zeppelin one is pretty much from cover from from beginning to end, one cover song after another of sure. one Willie Dixon song. You can get the chess box set and hear it for yourself. And I've played it for musicians that are very famous that had no idea that that took place. And I know what they were thinking. Why didn't I think of doing it? That's brilliant. <laughs> what that is. Well, they got away with it. You know, it, it wasn't quite close enough, but it's very close. They, they also ripped off a Moby Grape song off uh, Wow uh, Grape Jam. Uh, and he'll say it because he's a huge Moby Grape fan. Um, they, they ripped a, a whole song off that. Well, Dazed and Confused started out as a Yardbirds song and had totally different lyrics. So there was that fight about that. And then, uh, there was a band called The Creation since Ron Led Zeppelin. I love this kind of stuff. I always wondered where Jimmy Page got the idea of taking the bow and running it across the strings. He got it. It was inspired by 
the guitarist to the creation. I forget the name, the guy, the, the name of the guy, but you know, this is what which leads us to this next question I have for you guys. Because whether you're an author or a musician or a songwriter, composer, you get writer's block, I think. Um, yep. Some people claim they never do. So if uh, a little one is listening or somebody on their way up or even somebody who's well-established are having a really hard time coming up with anything, what do you guys do to combat the block? For, for me, um, I, I take the pressure off. And instead of pressuring myself to finish something, I, I just say to myself, okay, what did I accomplish today with this song? Did I get a line? Did I get a, a title? Did I get a bit of a melody that I really liked? Did I get something? And, you know, most of the time there is a piece of music that you kind of like why you started it. And so you grab a hold of that and then get away from it and let your mind sometimes like, where I write in the car, where because you have diversions, you know you're in traffic and you're you know things you can't be so entrenched in in the song, and you let your subconscious kind of take over. Yeah, and and so for me that's how it works. Same for you, John. Well, I, yeah, I, I hear that for sure, Frankie. Um, but I I usually that's kind of how I got into all this. Um, oh, I like this. Um, you know, if it wasn't for COVID nineteen, I'd be right there right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. A lot of people. I, I I've had a bunch of people that wanted to come up. Uh, I I go and try and produce something, and engineer something, record something, stay away from writing for a while, and then it all comes rushing back. I'm I, I'm working on a record right now, and uh, God, I have like nine songs in a few months that I'm and recorded and and I'm loving I, I almost I think my best stuff so uh sometimes uh you know uh, something like like coronavirus you know some something that just distracts you for a minute and then it frees your mind to to go but also there's like an inner calling that I get when it's time to write something and that's true you know yes and I, I would agree very true it's like it's so fulfilling when it's done. It's like, you know, you're probably like me, Frank. It, it's um, it's like lifeblood. It's like it's like you got to do it. You know, it, people say, well, you know, should I get into the music business because it's hard? And you know, you don't have a choice. You know, it's like if you're going to do it, you, you got to do it. It's a it's a relief. It's a, call, it's a calling. It's in your DNA. It's a calling. It's a calling you know, yeah. it sounds like a Steinfeld you know, episode. <laughs> yeah, it really does not. You it's know, a gift. I, I, it's a calling. It, it's a gift. It is a calling. All of those things. It's part of your blood. It's part of your DNA. Now, uh, you know, see, one of my things is I treat everybody the same, no matter who they are. I mean, if I'm in the room with Ringo Starr, I'm going to treat him the same as I would you guys, you know, just giving him my attention and respect. So one day I see this redheaded kid and he's sitting in front of my studio in New York City and I, I go out to him and I'm like, hey, and we have a nice conversation. And I thought he was my intern. I really did. I thought he was one of our interns. You know, I, I try to be friendly and welcome him, welcome, welcome him. I have dentures now. It's hard for me to talk. <laughs> I tried to be welcoming to people there when they go. come in. And uh, we're having about 20, 25 minute conversation. And this happens over two or three times. And his name is Ed. It turned out it was Ed Sheeran. That's, you heard that I, story? Forget. Did you hear me? I just said that. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so. And what I said to him is my advice was like, look, you know, you, I noticed you got your guitar with you. you like, but, and he, he doesn't say who he is. And I, honestly, I'm in a different circuit. So I probably wouldn't, wouldn't register. So I said, this is what I tell everybody that picks up a guitar and tries to learn how to play. Write as much as you can write every day and write down all of those little notes and keep them somewhere because they'll come useful over time. And you just got to keep working at it. You just have to like be in the, and the discipline of keep working at it. And that gets tiresome. Sometimes it's overwhelming and then you got to take a break. But that's my advice to anybody listening or watching. If you're a composer, if you're a writer, if you're a disc jockey, if you are a um, athlete, you just got to keep practicing. You got to always try to get 1% better every day. Yeah. Well, sometimes uh, for me, it was an innate thing because my dad was an opera singer. 
And wow. my mother and father took voice lessons and that's how they met each other. So there was always, <laughs> always music going on in my family. And so for me, trying to get away from hearing, I call them the Italian notes, because my father would be, you know, listening to Caruso and, and listening to Mario Alonso. And so I was hearing all these Italian notes all the time. And I'm like, I got to find the blue notes. You know, I got to find these <laughs> other notes because I'm hearing something else, Dad. And he had me singing from when I was 10 years old, raising money for cerebral palsy and oh. singing Be My Love and, and Love is a Many Splendors Thing. That's it. And so, you know, as I progressed, I, I put a, uh, an acapella group together called um, Frankie Love, L-U-V, and the Intruders. And we would go out and do this acapella stuff and open up for the Dupree's. <laughs> And by 15, I had a record deal on London Records. So that's awesome. There was, there was always this thing going on for me. And when I was 17, my parents had all these people over in, um, colleges showing films of their college. And this is where you should go to school. And I'm looking out the window. And the guy says to me, son, you haven't looked at any of these films. What do you want to do? And I just said, I want to be a singer. That's he totally goes, Your awesome. parents are about to waste a lot of money. <laughs> I um, like you, you know, I guess when we're growing up, we all have some, I believe most of us have some sort of introduction to music, whether it's Mr. Rogers or Sesame Street or the electric company. And for me, you know, I, I can re spe specifically remember being in school and we're getting ready to be part of the choir at church. And all of a sudden, some of us would break away and start doing doo wop because we thought it was the coolest. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, that's that's a lot of fun. We used to, to go down the train station because of, of the reverb. The acoustics, yeah. And, and we, we'd rehearse in the train station and stop. Everybody would gather around us and we'd be chirping. Before we talk about One World, uh, let's talk about your favorite song to sing in the shower. Frankie, you go first. Favorite song in the shower? To well, sing believe in the shower. it or not, um, because I have to sing it a lot live, I practice time of my life in the shower. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Fred, John, what about you? Uh, it's usually whatever new song I'm working on, what, a new song I'm trying to write. Uh, I'm trying to, and particularly now that I'm become an artist after all these years uh, singing. So uh, I, I'm always having, I'm always struggling, unlike Frankie, to get, uh, I can do it better with my falsetto than I can with my full voice, but to oh, get, yeah the pitch exactly where it's supposed to be yeah so i practice that and i can't I sometimes it's not in the shower but i'll sit with a guitar and i'll have to play the notes exactly so i can get my but for some reason my falsetto can hit the notes better than my full voice i have no idea why i have three that i rely upon your song it's a little bit funny this feeling inside and I, yeah, you know, yeah yeah i like to make sure that i get the pitch correct wish you were here by pink floyd Mm -hmm. and I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. It could be mid-July. <laughs> I just, I, I try to pick songs that I can remember the lyrics without too much yeah, trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Silent Night, oh my gosh. That is such oh, a you know, fantastic two classic, song. Classic, classic you know? song. Just love there it. Was just, there was just a thing on up here on the history of Silent Night. That is a great story. Did you it? Yes, well, I, I know the story. Okay. It was a uh, priest in Germany, yeah. somewhere in Bavaria, mm -hmm. and it was Christmas time. And he was making his rounds like all priests do, visiting the sick and giving the sacrament of the sick and bringing <laughs> people communion. And it was snowy out and uh, the organ at the church broke. And they were getting ready for the Christmas service. And, you know, they didn't know what to do. So one of the guys at the church had a guitar and the priest talk to the guy with the guitar, let's make something up for Christmas. And he was thinking about reflecting on his night and doing his parish work. And it was like silent night, holy night. And they were able to create that song in German, of course, which is right. just a beautiful to listen to. And yeah. that's the, basically the short story. I don't know the names of everybody involved, yeah. but when you go to Disney World and they have this Christmas light spectacular, Sometimes the orators for that night will tell you the background of the story and the whole crowd sings silent night. And I don't care who you are. There's not a dry eye because uh, when you hear right. the story about, you know, how people were just trying to, to bring joy and love to others using what they had, 
That's really the message. And that's what and you I, guys do as, as composers. I think people love hearing those stories, how the song was created and the behind the scenes. They, they usually have those songwriter um, evenings at some of the supper clubs around here. And the songwriter will sit there and talk about how we wrote the song. And this is, you know, and where I live, there are a lot of really um, popular musicians. You got Bruce down here and you have Bon Jovi down here and a lot of other musicians. So, Oh, let me guess. Navasink, New Jersey, Rumson. <clears throat> well, Rumson is where Bruce used to live. He's yeah. in Coast Neck now. I oh, live they all moved to Coast Neck. Yeah, well, of course, Ocean Ocean Port, yeah, which nice. is about five miles from Asbury. Yeah. But it's a very musical um, community down here. And what, what's great about it is a musician uh, that's, you know, 50s and 60s still has an audience. I mean, they, they we can go down and play the Camp AC Theater holds 1500 and it'll be jammed. Yeah, it's nice. You know, and people just support musicians down here it's just a whole other feeling than any other place i lived and it and it crosses genres i mean back in the day Big in time. asbury park you know i worked at some of those stations down in the area and we were always moving grooving places like the fast lane stone pony oh yeah uh just having a good mrs. time so now, i played M mrs j's before it was the stone pony and the sunshine inn which was another place down you know in the 70s where you know popular rock bands would play. I don't know what went on in Tom's River. And we're going to play one of the videos uh, coming up after this little story. I don't know what happened in Tom's River in the music scene, but I remember visiting my grandfather who was uh, at a nursing home and it was the stage area that they used as a kitchen. And I go, Grandpa, this is a great place. I go, um, I noticed there's a stage here. He goes, oh yeah, me and the boys used to come down here all the time. I go, the boys? Who are the boys? Ah, oh, come on, you know, Al Capone, Meyer oh. Lansky, and he's going down Murder Row, <laughs> and I'm voice. just, my voice, my my jaw dropped. I'm like, out of all of those guys, you're still alive with all the stuff that you pulled, <laughs> right? So, um, there is a rich uh, culture and history of music on the Jersey Shore area. I don't think too many people are well aware of, but it's just phenomenal, right? So let's talk about the One World with Russia, Earth, okay. Wind, and Fire that we have going on here. What are you guys up to? Well, this um, One World is something that um, is a project that I got asked to join um, right after the Academy Awards. Um, it was BMI and Columbia Records put together a songwriting seminar uh, to pick 25 songwriters to represent the United States. So. Barry Mann, Mike Stoller, Cindy Lauper, Desmond Child, Diane Warren, 25 of us went to the Soviet Union and wrote with 25 uh, songwriters, Russian songwriters, uh, Estonian songwriters. And in nine days, we wrote 50 songs. And so one of those songs that I wrote with Sergei Manukian and Mick Targa and uh, Pam, Pamela Philip Olin was a song called One World. And we came back home and Columbia Records picked 10 songs out of the 50 and one world was chosen and they had earth wind and fire recorded and never did anything with it they kind of just let it uh let the album fizzle because they had a a new regime that was coming in and it wasn't really representing their project and so the song sat there until about six months ago when i was doing an interview like this one and the question was asked to me how, how are the American musicians and songwriters going to get to the other side of normal? And I said, American songwriters? I said, try the world. I said, we are living in one world. It, this pandemic is affecting all of us. And so I had so many friends that were musicians and actors that were hurting and didn't know how they were going to pay their bills. So I decided to put a charity together with these foundations and added the First Responders Children Foundation and the NAACP as the final one. And basically uh, recorded the song called Pamela Philip Olin Up. And she had a friend, John Gillitin, who wrote New Attitude for Patti LaBelle. And so he produced the track and Bill Schnee mixed it. Now, all the people that played on it, the majority of them are uh, Grammy nominated or Grammy winning singers, songwriters. Uh, players. And so the song came out. You can go to oneworldhoursong.com 
And as you go to that website, you'll see. Oh, there it is. You're yeah, right how about that, it, brother? You're right on top of it. And you'll see Patty LaBelle's on there talking about the song. Tico from Bon Jovi is on there. Uh, Evelyn Champagne King, uh, Christine Ebersole. So all these people are going, hey, this is a great song. It's for great causes. And so if you purchase or you donate to one of the charities, you get a free download. So we're giving the song away. And that's basically one world. Well, let's play it right now. No matter who we are, there's only... Uh-oh. No matter who we are, there's only one world, one love to share. Hi, I'm Patty LaBelle, and please make a contribution to OneWorldRSong.com for those musicians and singers who are out of work now, and we're all in need of a little help right now. So God bless you, and thank you for helping I'll be there, I'll be there when you need me. I'll be there, I'll be there, you know you gotta hold now. Someone like you, someone like me, dreaming a dream of what could be. Do we believe, or maybe we do, it all comes down to me and you, no matter who we are, there's only one world, one love to share.
One world. That's great. <laughs> OneWorldRsong.com is the site to visit if you want to make a donation. Great video, guys. Well, very well done. Thank you. Thank um, you. Now let's talk about how John discovered Maroon 5. <laughs> a little birdie told me that uh, that was you. So why don't you tell us the rest of the rock and roll story? Okay. Well, it was uh, they were called Karen's Flowers at, uh, then. Same exact guys. Um I was working with a guy named Tommy Allen, who was in a band with me, and we started a production company. We we signed we we signed a couple of bands to deals, a band called The Size, and blah blah blah. He moved out to Malibu, and one day he was walking down the beach, and he heard this music. and And Tommy's a a big kind of raspberries uh, that type of thing, and um, he just heard the band uh, Adam singing and and the songs that Kara's Flowers were doing. And he- Where were uh, they, in the garage? They were in a garage, like a party. So he went in and talked to them. And uh, the next thing you know, I'm flying out there and uh, we're in the studio. We, we did four songs in one day just to see how we liked the, the um, chemistry. And then uh, we went ahead and we recorded a, a record, basically the, their first record. Um, and then then they got signed to Warner Brothers and didn't really take off. Uh, they broke up, uh, same guys, reformed as Maroon 5. And Carrots Flowers was a little more rock Absolutely. than, um, than um, what Maroon 5 ended up being, a little more R&B um, centered. But, uh, you know, we knew right away, uh, you just... There was no stopping Adam Levine. Uh, and he was uh, kind enough on The Voice recently. Uh, they asked all the people on there, all the uh, judges on there, uh, what was their turnaround, you know, chair turnaround moment. And he singled both uh, Tommy and myself out as as the first guys who, um, you know, brought them forward. You know, that's really cool. I mean, just have somebody acknowledge you uh, yeah, no, form like that. I'd be like, man, it. man, I made it. In fact, <laughs> on my record, um, right behind me, uh, which I just did this year, last year, got to go backwards. Um, the bass player, um, Mickey Madden, plays bass on uh, one of my songs, um, In God's Shadow. is actually a song I wrote with John Waite and uh, Keith Reed from uh, Procol Harum fame. Oh, Procol Harum. Yeah. And uh, a guy named Anthony Cryzon. So we, I redid that song. John Waite recorded it in the 90s. I redid it completely slowed down like a, what I, in my mind, was an English folk song. And um, Mickey from Maroon 5 is playing bass on that. Awesome. Now, uh, one thing about the songs from Dirty Dancing, yours, I've had the time of my life, Hungry Eyes. It's been on so many TV commercials. Um, how big are your bank accounts? No, 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 no. I'm just kidding. Um, how does it feel when, you know, your songs are featured in TV commercials or Super Bowl halftime shows, stuff like that? Great moments. I mean, you know, obviously you want to write a song that um, stands the test of time. And uh, usually songs come and go. And, and uh, I, I think that, the song has entrenched itself into society and into, um, you know, the fabric uh, of the, not only America, but the, the world. Most I, of us, I think most people on the planet probably can hum or <laughs> sing a, a couple of lyrics. The hills are alive with the yeah. sun or Edelweiss, do, you know? I do it all the time and drive my wife nuts, you know? See that I do the same thing, especially with Edelweiss. I'm like, play that again. We will, we will Edelweiss. sing it. Edelweiss. <laughs> Eyes, yeah. eyes, every morning you meet me soft and, and we've actually taken a trip to the von traps lodge mm. in um mm -hmm. vermont yeah i'm telling you that, that's a great place well we lost frankie so lost frankie. i don't know where he was going so why don't you just finish up because you probably do know the rest of the story well i i know he was saying that he goes down they do these dirty dancing festivals and um he was talking about europe and such um People from Czechoslovakia will come up to him. I love that song. It's my favorite. You know, so people from all over the world come all the way to North Carolina where they do these dirty dancing uh, show. You know, it's where they filmed 
Dirty Dancing, even though it was supposed to be in the cat, in the cat skills, skills, right? Yeah, they, I, I guess I mean, opinion wise, it was easier for them to go down there. Um, so you know, there's people from all over, and you know, listen, the play has been in almost every country in the world. I I saw the play in uh, with my family, my son when he was a little kid, uh, in uh, Hamburg. We saw it in London. Um, we saw it in Canada, uh, Toronto. Um, and I could have gone to elsewhere. I'm, uh, Eleanor Bergstein, who wrote the movie, was always trying to get me to Rome and Paris. I mean, it's been everywhere. So it, it's, uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon. And I guess that was the yeah, point. Yeah, see, that's great to- because that I guess that's where the Sound of Music thought was coming to me. Like, have you ever been on that tour? You go to South. So there's similarities to that. So you're pretty much, think about it, on parallel with that classic. I mean, that that's got to... That's got to really make you feel good about yourself. I, I'd does. be happy about that. It does. And, you know, it's usage, both the time of my life and Hungry Eyes. But um, I remember that show, New New Girl, I think, um, Zoe Deschanel. Their, their pilot for that show was all about the time of my life. That, that It was based on the time of my life, that, you know, and, and actually referred to it in a couple of other episodes and then like the movie get out did you see that how it was used and get out she's she's um uh, brian uh what's his name's daughter um brian williams daughter i can't think of her name but she's in she's in get out and she's got her headphones on and and if you know the story about get out or maybe i shouldn't give it away but uh, there's about there's about to be kind of like a murder t- takeover, and she's listening to the time of my life. It was her who was causing this to happen, and it was just such a unique use of the song. Uh, so it pops up everywhere. And, and how many how many TV shows do, do they try and do the lift, or uh, oh, nobody puts baby in the corner? So Eleanor Bergstein, I, I give her I, I uh, give her kudos because she's. She created a phenomenon. She created uh, an American icon, iconic movie, and uh, and the references to the movie or the songs or a line to the movie uh, are are everywhere. Con- yeah. It never stops. There's not too many people on this planet that can even say that about themselves that are part of something that big. So kudos to you and and Frank who uh, dropped off the planet. We don't know yeah, where he is. About. I wonder um, if I that's all right. Well, well, let's talk about the December 18th event with Lisa Naomi Swayze and the planning of future Frankie and John Zoom cast to raise funds for nonprofits. And you got your dirty dancing demos and all of that stuff. So let's right. uh, you know talk about that. Well, uh, on December 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, we're doing um Rock and roll rock, fantasy rock camp. and roll fantasy camp that David Fishoff ha- has a normally uh, you would go to Florida and you'd spend yeah. again with Roger Daltrey or whatever, but since the pandemic he's had to um, do it um, you know virtually Zoom wise. So we're gonna do uh, Frankie and I uh, are gonna do a Zoom um, about our con- contributions um, to the movie The Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes, and uh, I'm gonna have. Actually, the uh, Pro Tools. Um, oh, okay. Of, you know of the session. So, of course, that was taken from Ooh. tape directly to Pro Tools because back then there was no Pro Tools. Right. So, uh, and we're gonna, you know, dissect and talk about and uh, explain how and why and stuff like that. I've actually hosted one of those rock and roll fantasy camps. or was mm-hmm. one of the speakers. I did the the disc jockey thing with Ron Delsner, oh, cool. a contra promoter, and when yeah. they were in New York, I I really dig the whole rock and roll fantasy camp. What a great way to spend your some of your time and and learn. Right. And you brought up the Pro Tools thing. Now uh, this is my neck of the woods. So you took those eight track sessions, or how many tracks do you they use? Were actually, on? Uh, 24, A track, track, then we bounced it to 24. We went to Tony Camillo's studio in New Jersey, uh, who Tony did uh, a lot of the Gladys Knight and the Pip stuff. Right. We went there and we uh, did some overdubs. They wanted the song slowed down a little bit. We added some timbales. Um, and uh, curiously enough, there's a, a reverb that I just purchased that's up in the other side of my barn that I, unbeknownst to me, uh, came out of um, uh, Tony's studio, an EMT reverb from the fifties. Actually, it uh-huh. says, uh, says West Germany on it. And um, uh, 
as it turns out, it, it was used on this, on our demo version of, of the time of my life. So I feel uh, honored. It, it actually was originally owned by um, uh, Holland and Dozier out of Detroit. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So now, the that's the Motown sound in case anybody's wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so was Tony's Tony's uh, location of his studios were where in New Jersey? Was it closer you know, to Philadelphia? You know, I don't know. Frankie would know that. Frankie, come back. Uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, well, because Gladys Knight and the, the, Phil the Philadelphia sound. So, yeah, I was just yeah. curious about that. That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't realize he, he cut his teeth, him and, and um, uh, I guess, uh, Bon Jovi. Um, Tony? Tony Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. And did a lot of time in at Motown. I didn't know that in Detroit. And then well, they came back. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't know that. That that's amazing. You know, that being able to grasp a little bit from each of those genres and, and to yeah. just be present while they're recording, you learn a lot. Now, um, so you took those tracks from the tape and then you transferred them to the Pro Tools. Now I'm gonna ask you this question. Did you take each one of the tracks and put it into uh, your Pro Tools at, at one at a time? Uh, no. Or did I, you just like, did you, did you like almost like as if you were bouncing down to your quarter inch? How did you do it? Yes. You, you had to go 24 into 24. I mean, it was 24 outs of the tape machine. Oh, I see. Into 24 inputs because to do them one at a time, they wouldn't line up necessarily. So right, have, I get you. I, I just I was curious. This, yeah. I do this all the time with, with my machine. Now, I'll, I'll record either I'll, I'll, re I'll record drums I'll, into Pro Tools and then I'll run it through that tape machine and run it back. And you have to then take it and line it back up again. But yeah, uh, it's such a beautiful sound. Tape is just beautiful. I, but you know I, what? Go ahead. Go, no, no. I, I just, listen, go ahead. What were you going to say about oh, that? Oh, I was just going to say it, it was 24 track, but they were filled up. So you'd get like a percussion track for the first, on uh, stay on track two, there'd be percussion, percussion, and then all of a sudden you go to a horn part <laughs> and, uh, because that was you know you run out of space. Now yeah. with tools, you never run out of space. But but so I had to, so I I was able to record them directly as they were, and then I'd, if the horn part was on one track, I'd grab it and put it on another track. See, I I love that. You get to the point. I don't know how many people are going to find this fascinating, where you can actually look at the sound wave and you know exactly what it is. You know exactly what word it might be or what phrase, especially if you work with the vocals all the time. Yeah. You know what their breath looks like. You can yeah. actually read it like a doctor yeah. reading the. Um, you can. You know, the, the one of the downsides is, you know, it, it. I try and do a happy medium because one of the downsides is you can perfect and needle, you know, needle in on every and everything and everything. You know, yeah, but then you ruin it because you're exactly. always you're doing it. The reason we like communications breakdown is because Robert Plant's singing out of tune at times, you know, that's beautiful. That's, that's what's perfect about it. Perfectly out of tune. You know, when you have a chance to, that's why in my opinions, a lot of pop music today is too manicured, too perfect. And it, besides my other theory that digital music does not implant imprint on your brain Oh. As much as analog music. Let me let me just say this: you probably have seen the difference between traditionally recorded material. Even if you use Pro Tools, there's a way to do it that emulates what you can do on tape, the multi-track, right? But I've I've been I I just am beside myself when I get some MP3s from people, and it's compressed to where it's a straight line. Oh. I, I've got I mean, what the hell is that? That sounds uh -huh. like crap to me. I mean, because I can. I can see it and tell it it's crap. Right? Nine, because they're they're competing. I find this, I, I go to one of the greatest uh, mastering guys, Greg Calby at Sterling Sound. And and um he, you know, I a lot of times because most of his clients want him to do that, he'll say the first pass, he'll send it to me. I go, Greg, you should, you know, you know me by now. I don't want that. I want, you know, he goes, Well, I just thought you want to compete with everybody else. No, actually, I want I want people to hear the quiet section and the big section. I want dynamics in my music. And it's also a reflection of the type of music that I usually end up recording. Uh, you know, a pop tune, a Katy Perry song, you know, it's going to be balls to the wall the whole way. For, it's all digital signal, you know. Well, it, it also, well, there's, I think there's a resurgence in recording artists where they're going back to tradition 
uh, especially with vinyl out now, right? So yeah. what what is old is new again, yeah. and we can go on and on for hours. So fr- uh, John, we'll have to do this again where we talk about recording, and then maybe get yeah. another recording guy, a couple engineers, yeah. and just talk shop. It'll be, It'll be, be talking shop. We'll, we'll we do on that. I would enjoy. Uh, it. So for the rock and roll fantasy camp, I guess people can always look it up online. But I know in your Facebook page at Dirty Dancing Demos. Uh, people can go and find out more information about the event on December 18th. They could see what's going on with you guys and see some of the videos, uh, catch the one world. And before we leave, what we're going to do now, um, John, yes. is play uh, your video okay. of Hungry Eyes. And hopefully we will not get banned. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a topic for a different discussion yeah. some other day, John. But you do. I think, can I send you mine from, would, would they not have Tracer on that? I don't know. I don't know how it works. So let's see if we can get away with it. It's my song. It's, it's mine and Frankie's song. It's, it's my, I own the masters of the recordings. I, I, it's ridiculous. I you own the publishing rights, correct? The publishing I and mean, we did the video. <laughs> So, so maybe this will be a test case and we'll suit you. Yeah, let's, How about yeah, let's, let's go. And away we go. <laughs>
Hey. <laughs>